So leading up to Mother's Day, we've been looking at the way Jesus interacted with with different women, and on Mother's Day now, we're going to look at how he interacted with his own mother. We're going to look at John chapter 2, 1 through 11. John 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six water, stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. So on this Mother's Day, it's important to remember that even Jesus had a mother. He was not just the Son of God, He was also the Son of Man. He had a mother just like every one of us. So how did He treat His mother? How do you, how as the Son of God do you have a mother? How do you honor your father and a mother when you are the Son of God? How does that work? That's quite an quite a interesting relationship there that Jesus would have had with his mother. We have an interesting case of Jesus interacting with his mother here. In verse 1 there, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, it says. She, she was already there. But you notice that it doesn't name her, does it? It just says Jesus' mother. Like three times it just does that. Did you pick that up? It doesn't say Mary. In fact, it doesn't say Mary anywhere in the Gospel of John at all. And there's a reason for that. Jesus' mother would later become John's mother, which explains why he never uses her first name. At the end of the Gospel of John, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he sees John, or it's not named, it's the disciple who he loved, and his mother standing there. And he said to his mother, Behold your son, and to the disciple, Behold your mother. And it says from that time on, this disciple took his mother into his house. He looked after her because it was the oldest son's responsibility to look after mom. They didn't have social security back then or any nursing homes, so it would be the oldest son's responsibility. So John became, or kind of became the oldest son in place of Jesus. So Mary was kind of like his mother. And you never see her name mentioned in the entire Gospel of John. So I just wanted to call attention to that. In in verse 3 there, so it says, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Okay? Now, I want to call attention to a few things here. No more wine would bring tremendous shame on the hosts. This is a wedding, and as a host... 
you want to have as many people there as possible, kind of the more the merrier sort of a thing. So you would invite all kinds of people. You'd invite the whole town. You'd invite all your relatives and any friends that you'd have. It would be a huge celebration. So if there was no more wine, this would, this would bring a lot of shame on you. It would mean that you couldn't provide for all of the guests and that they wouldn't have a good time. And these wedding feasts back then, they lasted like seven days. This was not just a reception after the wedding and then everybody goes home. This is, no, this is a seven-day thing here. So after a few days, if there were more people who showed up than maybe you anticipated, you might start to run out of things. The hosts are expected to have enough for everyone to give them all a good time because this is a joyous celebration. And if they don't, then one, uh, one source I read said they would be basically the, the butt of jokes for forever for that. So lots of shame because of running out of wine. This happy couple who was, who was getting married here was probably family to Jesus. There's a few clues that we have here. It, it's possible that it was a family friend, but I'm thinking that this is a relative. Because first of all, it says this wedding was at Cana in Galilee. Jesus was not from this town. This was a town a little ways away. It was still in the area, but it was not his town. So this would not be a village wedding that Jesus happened to attend because he lived in that village. And when you travel for weddings, it's usually because it's a relative, especially when your mom also travels too. It says in verse 1 that Jesus' mother was already there. It says Jesus was invited, his mother was already there. Kind of giving us the impression that she was there helping make preparations because this was family. She was there, and not just there, but she was also feeling kind of responsible for how things went. She comes up to Jesus, there's no more wine. Like, hey, we, we have a stake in this. This is kind of important. And then in verse 2, it says, Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. So, Jesus kind of, I mean, sometimes we have like a plus one in our invitations. Well, Jesus had was starting his ministry, so he, had, he didn't have all of his disciples yet, but he had some of them. And so they were allowed to come too. So Jesus wasn't just a, an extra invite person. He, he was allowed to bring his people with him, his disciples with him. So this is probably family. Some, maybe a distant relative, but family. Mary goes to Jesus because... She believes he can do something about this. She wouldn't have gone to him if, if he, she didn't think he could do anything about it. You go to people who you think can help you. If there's people who can't help you, you usually bypass them. So in this time of need, she goes to Jesus. It says in verse 11, Jesus hadn't done a miracle before. This was his first one. So, Mary sees something here. She's having some faith here. Because Jesus hadn't even done a miracle yet. And now she's asking him to. Jesus' response here is kind of interesting. Verse 4, he says, Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. Okay? Okay. When he says woman here, that's not being disrespectful like it might be today. It, it is odd, though, that he would say this to his mom. When it says dear woman in our translation, in the Greek, it's just woman. And they, they translate it dear woman because it doesn't have those kind of derogatory connotations that it, that it might hear today. So if you just say call somebody woman, that's you know what are you what are you saying? And that's the kind of thing that 
I'll, I'll say to Deirdre if I want to tease her or something. You know, so like there was one time when, uh, usually I, I, make, I make supper, and, but there was one time when, when I was sitting down before she was, and, and she said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you your food, don't worry. And uh, so I thought, oh, I'll just have some fun with this here. So I, so I said, where's my food, woman? And she burst out laughing. She loved that. It, it, it kind of has a different connotation. Back then, though, it wasn't necessarily derogatory like that. It is, though, kind of establishing some polite distance here. He's kind of keeping her at arm's length. A little. He actually addresses her as he does any other woman. Because later in this gospel, he would say this the same thing to the Samaritan woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, and Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb. This is just a common way to address someone, but it's not common for your mom. So he's addressing her as if she were just another woman in his life. Not, almost not his mom. Well, she is asking him to kind of, can you pull rank here? Can you, you, you have some power as, as the son of God. Can you, can you pull that out right now? We're kind of in some need. So she's asking him to be the son of God here. And as the son of God, their kind of relationship changes a bit. As the Son of God, she is just another woman who needs salvation like the rest of us. Mary, it says in the Bible, is blessed. I mean, she was honored to be the promised mother through whom salvation would come into this world. The one to fulfill that promise all the way back, made it in Genesis 3. Big deal. She was honored. She was blessed for sure but she was not sinless. She needed a Savior just like the rest of us do. And so her asking him to be the Son of God, he addresses her a little differently now. Dear woman, he says, why do you involve me? A more literal translation is, what is it to me and to you? What, what is this? What is, what is that what, is this really our problem here? Is this our business? Why does this concern us? There's a, there's a line that, that I learned at, at Wedgwood when I was working there where there were a lot of kids who, if they, if they lost something or they thought that somebody had taken something from them, they would, they would sometimes run right up to you and, and this would be like the end of the world to them. And there would be a line that we would use Sometimes it would say, your, your crisis is not my emergency. You know, I'm, I'm in the middle of something. I'll get to you in a minute. But your crisis is not my emergency. It's almost like Jesus is saying that. Uh, this crisis is not our emergency here. What is this to us? And then he kind of explains, my time has not yet come. It wasn't time yet for Jesus to start performing signs. In John, they're called signs. When Jesus did, did miracles, they were signs of who he really was. It's not yet time to reveal his glory. He was on his father's timeline, not our timeline. A little later, one of his brothers says, hey, if if you, if you want to make something of yourself, then you should go down to the feast because, because everybody who wants to make a name for themselves you know, needs to be out in public. And Jesus' answer was, um, my time is not yet right. For, for you, any time is right. But, but I'm on my Father's timeline. It wasn't yet time Jesus is clearly dodging his mother's request here. So he, he calls her dear woman, distance, okay? You're, you're just 
just like any other woman to me right now. He says, it's not our concern, and it's not the right time. So we got three things here where Jesus is saying, um, no, I don't think so. You'd think she'd take no for an answer. But she doesn't. In verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. She didn't take that as a no. She took that as a yes. Isn't that interesting? His mother believes he not only can, but will do something here. She didn't take that as a no. She took that as a yes. In this passage, his mother shows great faith here. This is, this is the kind of faith that has persistence that Jesus rewards. There's a few times when he, Jesus is a little resistant to heal somebody, and there's a person in faith who persists, and Jesus rewards them and, and heals them. She doesn't take no for an answer here because she believes. And, and here's, a, here's a lesson for us too. If you believe in God, don't, don't take no for an answer. Jesus tells us, teaches us to be persistent in prayer. We can do that. <laughs> We can be persistent. We can go to him with that same request day after day, hour after hour, minute by minute. We can be persistent. In fact, he told us to be persistent. So he tells this story of a, a widow and an unjust judge where there's, there's this unjust judge who, who he doesn't care about anybody. He's just all out for himself. But there's this widow who, who needs justice, and so she keeps on bothering him until he does. And so finally he gives up and says, all right, I just want to get rid of this woman, so I'm going to give her justice that she needs. How, how much more, he says, would, would your heavenly Father, who actually cares about you, see that you get justice? Be persistent, he says. And there's other stories in the Bible where persistence is rewarded. Sometimes God kind of, when we pray about something and we ask Him for something, sometimes He'll kind of take a step back and be like, really? You know, is this what you really want? Or, hey, maybe this isn't a good idea. You know, and sometimes God, God kind of pulls away about things like that. And Jesus answers His mom, basically, No. It's not the right time. This is not our concern. But what does she do? She persists. Why would she persist? Because she believes. She knows who he is. She knows he can do something about it. And she persists. She takes that as a yes. I want to encourage you to do that too. If God isn't answering your prayers, keep asking. Persist. Sometimes it takes 30 years, but God does come through. Let's look at the screen here a minute. Why did Christ command us to call God our Father? At the very beginning of our prayer, Christ wants to kindle in us what is basic to our prayer, the childlike awe and trust that God through Christ has become our Father. Our fathers do not refuse us the things of this life. God our Father will even less refuse to give us what we ask in faith. If an unjust judge can be persuaded, then certainly our loving Heavenly Father can. So let's not take no for an answer sometimes. Let's persist in that prayer. Just like Mary did. She's exhibiting some strong faith here. And her strong faith 
led Jesus to perform a discreet miracle before his time came. He kind of interrupted his timeline. Now, because he wasn't planning on it, he did this miracle a little differently than he did some other ones. Some of his miracles he did right out in the open. But this one, he kind of did behind the scenes. There were only a handful of people who knew what was going on here. He wasn't doing it to, to broadcast himself. He, he did it kind of under the radar a little bit. But he adjusted the timeline. This was his first sign. He says, my time has not yet come, but then he does it anyways. So he does it discreetly, but he still does it. It's almost like God can be persuaded. It's almost like, it's almost like he'll, he'll adjust his timeline for us. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? There's a few times in the Bible where it's almost like God kind of says, all right, I'll, 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 I'll make it happen. I wasn't, almost like I wasn't planning on it, but I'll, I'll do it that way. There's a few times where God says, I'm, I'm going to do this, and then there's a plea. And then, I mean, we know God doesn't change his mind, but, it, but there's some times where it's like, almost like he does when we, when we ask. The, God was tired of these Israelites. They, were, they, they make this golden calf after he delivers them out of Egypt. They saw the water part for these people. And then God says, all right, I'm done with these people. I'm, I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to make you, Moses, into a great nation. I'm going to just kind of start over here. And Moses says, Lord, what would the Egyptians think? Wouldn't, wouldn't they think that you were not able to bring your people into the land that you promised them? And it's like God changes his mind there. Prayer is powerful, people. It can even make God change his timeline. Let's never underestimate what a prayer can do. It's not magic. It's not like if you just say the right words in the right posture, God will do whatever you want. No, it's not like that. Because God works on the basis of love. And sometimes we ask for things that are not good for us or not, not the best. But let's never underestimate what a prayer can do. Let's never underestimate that. Because at least, the Bible at least leaves the impression that God might change his mind. Even when it says God doesn't change his mind. That, that, that's powerful. So in your trust of Jesus, do you respond like Mary does? There's one thing that she says here I want to call your attention to too. This is, as mothers, it's Mother's Day here. A lot of mothers out there. The best thing that you can teach your children is exactly what Mary says to these servants. Do whatever he tells you. The best instruction that you can give your children is to tell them and to communicate to them, do whatever Jesus tells you. I'm, I'm your mom or dad. He's your Lord. Do whatever he tells you to do. Look, look in here to see what that is. Do whatever he tells you to do. Because we as human beings, as, as parents, we... We think we know what's best for our kids, and most of the time we, we know, but there's a God out there who's, who's their true Father in heaven. And while children grow up and, and eventually start their own homes and stuff like that, they'll always be God's children. They'll always answer to Him. They won't always answer to us. They'll always answer to Him. We need to teach them for the time that they're under our roof, our authority. Do whatever he tells you to do. That's the best instruction that you can give your kids. Now, in this passage here, we're kind of focusing on Jesus and Mary and their interactions. John kind of has a main point here. 
I don't want to just bypass this. John's main point here is that Jesus turns legalistic washing into joyous celebration because the Jews had certain laws about how they had to be clean before God. And so these, these jars here were for ceremonial washing. And so Jesus uses the water in these ceremonial jars to be clean. And instead of having water, he turns it into wine. So instead of ritual, you have celebration. Instead of just life, which is crucial, uh, water and life are tied together in the Bible, you have, you have joy. So Jesus replaces what the Old Testament was. He fulfills it. So this is, this is kind of the picture that John is trying to give to us here. But there's another point here that's, that's also just important. By faith, Jesus delivers his people from shame. This was his family here. He delivered his family from shame. The people that belonged to him would have been shamed by the whole village. And he delivers them from shame. He delivers us from shame too. We don't have to be ashamed. Jesus delivers us. I'm just going to close with Psalm 4, verse 7. It says, You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. Jesus fills our hearts with joy in place of shame. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we're so glad that you've sent Jesus Christ to take our shame away. We pray, O Lord, that our trust would be in him and that we would pursue him with everything that we need and pursue you, Lord. We pray that our prayer life would grow stronger, that, Lord, we would seek to follow you and teach that to our children too, and, Lord, that we would never find ourselves in shame because you have taken that shame away. In Jesus' name, amen.